Okay, so it's a, a pleasure to be here. It's a you know fantastic, uh, fantastic place. Um, so um, I'm going to tell you about uh, cat zero cube complexes and uh, you know the whole sort of theory um, around it. Um, I'll try to touch on on connections to various other things and and convince you that they're they're interesting objects. Uh, play with and that they're useful sometimes. So um, you're, you've, you've heard a lot about uh, cat zero spaces, um, right? So, and, and groups that act on them. So if you have, you have some group acting on a cat zero space um, by isometries, And maybe you know you'll you'll be happy if the action is uh, properly discontinuous. Or we'll just say proper actions. Um, and and maybe you'll be interested in co-compact. So when something like this when something like this happens, then then you're then you're happy. Right, then you, you know all sorts of things about the group. Sometimes you can drop some of these properties and you still know something about the group and, and you're still somewhat happy. Um, so, so that's the sort of general setting, right, in which uh, you know, a lot of what's, what's going on in this, in this workshop, um, in this program, is about. So I'm going to be talking about a particular class of such things, um, which um, you get by just gluing cubes together. So it seems very kind of mundane or, or simple or combinatorial, whatever your uh, favorite word is to describe it, but it's actually very quickly becomes uh, quite, quite interesting. So um, a cube complex Um, is just uh, a complex obtained by by gluing cubes together uh, via isometries of their faces. Okay, so, so you go to uh, Ikea or you go to eBay or whatever and you order some cubes. Right, and these are, these are all um, unit cubes. So they're very simple. They're just products of zero, one. Okay. some edges, and then you've got some rules for how to glue them together, right? You'll, you know, maybe you'll glue this to that, and this to that, and so on. Maybe this guy gets glued to this guy, this point here, right? You know, in all the manuals, they'll say AA and AA, and there's a little picture, and that means to glue those two, two things together. And so then you'll get some kind of a uh, after you do this, you'll get some kind of a complex. Maybe it's, you, you won't necessarily be able to draw it because you've glued all kinds of faces together in all kinds of strange, strange ways. And that's, that's the, the class of, of beasts that we're um, interested in. And we're going to uh, restrict it somewhat. So, um, so let me just remind you that if link of a vertex so if you if you're sitting inside of uh, one of these these complexes and you look at a vertex then this is very similar to what you do in, in simplicial complexes you maybe you have some edges and then you have some squares and then maybe uh, you, know, you can have many squares Maybe you've got some three cube. So 
I have limited artistic uh, abilities here, but maybe something like this. Maybe you've got a three cube over there that you've attached. Okay. Um, so the link of a vertex. So uh, so the link of a vertex v, where v is in uh, a vertex in your in your complex, is uh, a vertex for each edge incident on V. And by this, I mean that you, you look very closely. You look at a sort of small neighborhood, and you see what you see. So there's a vertex there, a vertex there, a vertex there. And then an edge for each corner of a square. So on uh, a simplex for each uh, corner of a cube for, each, for every higher dimensional thing. So here you would see, let me just draw it in a different color. You would see something like this, and then a simplex two-dimensional simplex over there, that would be the link. Kind of like what the, the small sphere around the vertex meets the, the complex. This is just like what you would see in, in a, the link of a vertex in a simplicial complex. OK, so, so then you can say what you mean by a non-positively curved Not positively curved cube complex. Um, so, so um, it's it's that's a cube complex in which you don't see certain things. Certain things are not allowed. So, you're not allowed to take uh, a square and glue two edges together in this format. So, um, so what you would see here in the link, so in the, in the link, in the link of E, you would see a loop, right? That's what you would see here, because these two edges, these two edges are identified, so these two vertices are identified in the link of this, this vertex, the vertex V. So you're not allowed to see, you're not allowed to see this. And then you're not allowed to see the following. So this would be kind of like a, a monogon, if you like. You're not allowed to see also the following, where this would be a bigon in the link. So a bigon would be something like, where you glue two squares to one another in such a way that those two things are, are glued together. So you would see in the link something like that. So that's, that's not allowed. Okay, and that makes the link, if you, if you think about that, that makes the link into uh, a nice simplicial, simplicial complex when you don't have allow any of these kinds of things. And then, um, so the, the link of the final thing is that, um, well, OK, so you don't allow these, these two things are, are not allowed. And the final thing is that the link of each vertex is what's called a flag complex. Okay, so this means this means that um, no missing simplices. 
in the length of, of B. Okay, so that means whenever you see the one skeleton of a simplex, then there's actually supposed to be a simplex there. So you can think of what, a situation where, where this would fail is when you glue, say, three squares together, okay, in, such, in this fashion. Well, what would you see in the link? You would see a triangle. Right? And so that triangle wants it to be filled in by a two-dimensional simplex. Well, the only way that can happen is if what you actually were looking at was uh, the corner of a cube. Okay, so here you actually see that guy. Um, that guy there. Okay, so that's uh, so you're not allowed to see these uh, kinds of things. And if you um, if you think about it, this is also these all three of these are kind of positive curvature, right? You see, you have in the link. You, if you imagine that this was length pi over two, right? So in all of these cases, you've got loops inside the link that are of length less than two pi. And that's not something um, you want in non-positive curvature. So, um, so Gromov uh, he sort of came up with this uh, this combinatorial condition: is that uh, so X is non-positively curved. In this definition, if and only if it is non-positively curved. That's a nice theorem. So this you learned about already, in what non-positive curvature is in using the cat zero, the local cat zero condition. So this is local cat zero, okay? And, and this is this definition using these, these flag complexes, okay? This, this very combinatorial definition Okay, so so um, so that's one of the one of the one of the reasons that people deal with cubes as opposed to you know when you first hear this you think well why cubes not some other type of polyhedra um, you can use them but to check non-positive curvature generally is a, not a trivial thing it's a difficult thing you get just arbitrary simplices even. Um, so if, you, if you're interested in that, there's uh, John McCammon has done quite a bit of work, Elder and McCammon. I should just make that as an aside. Quite a while back, um, uh, so other types of polyhedra. And, and this, this became, this is actually quite hard. So you, even very simple examples, they had very concrete examples of things they were looking at. They wanted to know that they were non-positively curved. Um, and checking, checking that is quite hard. Yeah. For, for all, all dimensions. Um, no missing simplices. So you're going to tell me that I'd have to fill in every edge. So no, I don't mean that. I don't, yeah, the real line gets to be non-positively curved. Yes, it does. So, okay, so yeah, for, for dimension bigger than one, okay, not zero dimensional. Um, guys, yeah, you're not, you're, okay, so if you're thinking of the, the simplest possible example, the graph, Okay, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit, but the simplest possible example is a graph, and those are non-positively curved. Okay, so, um, and in some sense, these are, these, you could think of these as generalizations of graphs in some, we'll, we'll talk, we'll come back to that. 
Okay. Um, so it's non-positively curved, and, and so that means that, uh, uh, so CAR-10 Adamar then tells you that X tilde is cat zero. Okay, it's a nice cat zero space. You just, you can think of you're going to take some uh, finite collection. One way you can think of trying to build groups acting on cat zero spaces in a very naive way is you're going to order your cubes on eBay, right? You're going to glue them together in some way using some finite description. Build a nice, finite, compact, okay, uh, non-positively curved complex. Check these conditions. These are eminently checkable conditions. You know, you're missing any simplicities and so on. And when you've done that, well, the universal cover will be cat zero and your group will act on it, right? So that's, so if uh, g equals pi one of x acts on x tilde, and so this will imply that g um, is, is a cat zero group. Okay, so um, we'll say, We'll say G is uh, a cat zero cube group, or some people like to say a cubulated group, okay, if it acts, well, we won't say freely, but uh, properly and co compactly. Um, on a cat zero cube complex. So that's, uh, you can ask yourself which groups are cube groups. Sometimes, and we'll talk about this maybe a little later on, you can, you can drop some of this and still, still be happy. Okay, you'll, you'll still learn something about, about the group. Um, okay, so that's the, Let's, talk, let's start looking at examples. Okay, now that we've got some kind of definition in mind. So, so the first thing is, is graphs. And I guess we can, we can talk about either the non-positively curved space that we're interested in, or we can talk about the universal cover, or we can talk about the cat zero space and the group acting on it. Okay, so if you have a graph, and, and here, Graphs are allowed to have loops in them, right? So on, there, there's your graph, okay? Um, so, well, what can, what can we say about this? The link of each of these guys is a discrete set. So the link, links of vertices are discrete, right, sets of points. So it satisfies this, this condition, okay, you're not going to see any loops like this that are less than 2 pi, basically, that's what's going on with this. Um, so, uh, so then, well, you can think of what groups are associated to this. So what groups are associated, what groups act on, on universal cover. So what's the universal cover of, of this, this guy? It's a tree, right? So this is the class of groups that act properly on trees, okay? So groups which act properly and co-compactly Trees, again, this is a slight, okay, I'm, I'm slightly lying here in the sense that if I'm thinking in terms of taking the universal cover, the universal, the act of the group on the universal cover is free, okay, but we're going to drop that sometimes when we're talking about this. So what groups, what groups do we get here? Okay, these, it's actually, it's actually a theorem. So 
these are uh, virtually three groups. We have to think about it a little bit to, to prove this. And if it, everything was just, you know, if the action here was free properly and co-compactly, then you just get free groups. Okay, but you can have finite point stabilizers, and this will give you graphs of finite groups. Okay, and graphs of finite groups, those of you that are, know what those are, um, that's where you record, you put instead of the trivial group here, you put finite groups at each of the vertices, and you get uh, groups which are actually virtually free. So that's uh, it's an interesting class of groups in and of itself. Um, and that's what comes up in, in dimension one. Okay, so you can think free groups here. That's the... Oh, wait, where is my... Where's my boundary here? Is this, this it? Like, I, I should go back there. That's what you're trying to tell me? Very politely? Very politely. So it's, yeah, it's a question of who you make happy. This would be even better if the, all of these went to the ceiling, right? And we just like have higher room, right? Well, or maybe it wouldn't be better, but it would certainly be impressive. Um, I don't think I've ever seen this much board space anywhere. This is like, at least in linear fashion. Um, what? Yes, exactly. It's an infinite square complex. Uh, right. So um, the next uh, next example. This is okay here, right? Or, or am I supposed to start here? I'm supposed to start here, right? Um, so so surfaces. Okay. So surfaces we we know are hyperbolic, right? But I mean, are they non-positively curved in in this sense? Okay, so what would you do? Okay, well, you would go back to you'd go back to your room and you draw something like this, right? And then you'd make some identifications, right? Like you all know how to do, right? You do. I mean, somebody knows how to do this. I think it's this, right? Right? You, you make those identities, the surface of genus 2, and you want to chop it up into squares. So, who's, anybody have ideas? Can you suggest something? Yeah? Hmm? Well, you want to do that. See, that's the problem when you ask the audience. Somebody will tell you something you've never thought about. Okay, so you want to do this. The other one, like this, you want a diagonal? One, two, three, four, that's got five. Okay. I want this to work for a genus bigger than two as well. So whatever answer you should give me, you might want to have it generalized. What's the kind of stupidest thing? That you, what? Hmm? What does this mean? Okay, you want to do this. Okay, that's again a, a di completely different answer than I thought of. Uh, I don't know if this works. Does this work? Uh, okay, let's think about the links of vertices. So, um, I don't know, it doesn't look to me like it works, does it? Or does it work? Let's see. So, what happens with the link of this vertex here? Um, this gets glued to there. Um, right? And what other... No, but we have other cubes. We have other cubes glued along over here. So we'll have these other guys. This might... Yeah, this might work. This might work. Okay. I didn't think of that. Okay. Um, so check. 
So, so what's your name? Justin. Okay, so Justin's cubulation. So you should all check. You should all check that it satisfies the condition. I have it. But I, I'm guessing that it does because you, you sh you're either going to have this pi over 2 or you're going to have these subdivided things. So you maybe will have six squares around the vertex. And six squares around the vertex is fine. What we're not allowed to do is, it's a two-dimensional thing. We're not allowed to have three. Okay? Sorry. Um, what, what I was uh, thinking of was, and it's the only thing I've ever thought about, right, is just put something in the middle and subdivide this way. Okay? That's got, it's not as efficient. This is not as efficient. This other guy, this other thing is not as efficient as Justin's cubulation. Okay, but it's somehow, you can see doing it for every, every genus, right? And what's going on here at, in terms of the links of vertices? Well, here you're going to see eight squares around the vertex. Okay, and here you'll also see eight. Okay, at, well, see, yeah, I shouldn't draw two things at once, huh? I get an F for board work. Teaching evaluation is going to be really bad. I can tell right now. Okay, so I won't mark it, but uh, okay. So in this in this cubulation, you're going to see eight around uh, these guys. Okay, eight squares around these guys, and these guys here, you're going to have four. You'll have two coming from here, and then you glue glue it to another edge, and there'll be two, so they'll the links are either squares or octagons. And, and that satisfies our conditions. Okay, so you'd think this is pretty simple. And the and thing that might come to mind is that you can do this for any, any negatively curved manifold, right? That's the thing you're going to think from this. So you can take any negatively curved manifold. You know, you put some points somewhere and then fill it in with cubes and check your condition and you'll accumulate it every hyperbolic manifold, and that turns out to not be true. So neg there are negatively curved manifolds that can't be done this way, and we'll, we'll talk about it. So uh, this kind of naive thing that works for surfaces doesn't always work. Um, so, so the next thing you might you might think about is is three manifolds, because that's the next dimension. Often maybe uh, hyperbolic three manifolds, uh, and there's a whole long story here, and we'll we'll talk about this story a little bit later on. Okay, so um, these guys, the hyperbolic ones. all act uh, properly, uh, co-compactly. Um, on on cat zero cube complexes. Yeah, you are right. For pi one of hyperbolic three manifolds. Thank you. Um, all act properly and compactly on CAD zero cube complexes. This this will follow uh, from work that I'll talk about later on. I'll, I'll so this is a theorem, and I'll I'll tell you about the pieces of this uh, a little bit later on. Um, but the interesting thing about this that it, it's not done in this naive way. The cube complexes that you end up building here can be very high dimensional. So it's kind of an interesting thing. Um, it's, it's not true that they all act, that they can all be cubulated in this way. Okay, so it turns out that there are hyperbolic three manifolds that you can't chop up into cubes. Nice three, make them into a nice three dimensional cat zero cube complex that it'll act on. Um, it's, an, it's an open question whether they all virtually do. 
So whether you can find a finite cover that you can do in this in this naive way. So so question to all pi one of hyperbolic three manifold. Yes, yes. Closed. Um, yeah, so properly co-compactly will mean actually really properly co-compactly. Mm, yeah, it's also true for finite volume. Um, but then it won't be co-compact. Um, there won't be a proper co-compact action. I don't know if that's, in, in any event, uh, Let's just stick to this at this stage of the, the game. I have to think about it for the finite volume one. Um, so, so the question is, do all uh, closed, hyper closed, just stick to closed, hyperbolic three manifolds uh, have finite covers, which can be Manipulated in uh, this naive way. Okay. In other words, the actual three manifold is is a cat zero cube complex. So. Okay. Um, so, anyway, I'll, I'll, like I said, I'll come back to. Um, that that story in in due course. I just wanted you to get you to think about just just see already that in dimension three um, there are already interesting things that are going on. Um, what about uh, so products of graphs? Or let's just say products of products of trees. Let's just say products of trees. So you take uh, a product of two trees. That's a you can check that that's so exercise. Um, what's the link? What's the link of a vertex for a product of two? Or you, it's enough to think about a product of two graphs. What would be the link of a of a vertex? What kind of graph is that? So think of just a product of R and R, right? That would be the simplest, right? Uh, valence two, valence two. So what do you get there for the link? Right? You get there's two vertices that come from one of the graphs and another two comes from the other graph and what do you do you join them together when they're different colors so what do you think now happens in the product of two graphs I suppose it would now a trivalent so there were three orange points and three yellow points well what would you what would the link then be well, you'd get a square for every pair of these guys, right? Okay, so the link of a vertex is a complete bipartite graph. Okay, and the, that's a, that satisfies our conditions, right? It's, it's, it's a graph this time. You're not filling anything in with two dimensional, so there are no cycles of length. Uh, less than uh, four. So, um, so that's what happens in, so, so these guys will be locally cat zero, and so these are nice cat zero, uh, nice cat zero spaces, and so you can take the product of a group acting on a tree and a product of a group acting on a tree and get attacked on a product of two trees, right? So that's, 
you take a product of two, think about it, taking a product of two graphs and taking its universal cover and getting a nice, nice action on, on that. And um, more generally, uh, a product of two non-positively curved, so that will be non-positively curved uh, cube complexes is non-positively curved. And you can try to think of what the description would be, right? You have a simplicial, a nice flag complex for one guy, a nice flag complex for the other. And it turns out there's a notion called the join of those two things, which will also satisfy the flag condition. So, um, so I'll leave this as an exercise. And, and the hint, the hint is joins. So think about what, if you don't know, then look up what the join of two simplicial complexes is. And that turns out uh, to be what happens here. So it's all very nice. Um, even in this, let me just give you a very specific example uh, from the literature. So here's something you could order on eBay for four squares. Um, So this is an example. You should check that the link of a vertex here satisfies this condition. Okay, so, um, so, so here's another exercise. And these sort of local to global things. Think about if uh, the link of uh, a simply connected uh, cube complex is a complete is complete bipartite. Links, sorry, I was going to say, yeah. yeah. I sort of, you know how it is. You, you start writing something, and then you. That's why people prepare slides, but okay. So um, R complete bipartite. So that means it's particular, it's two-dimensional complex. Oh, so two-dimensional complex. This implies that uh, the complex is a product of trees. So just by knowing locally that it's, these are complete bipartite graphs, you, you get that the universal cover is a product of trees. And so it's not that easy, let's think a little bit. Um, but then here you just have to check that condition here and you get an example um, of uh, a group. So this acts, so uh, this is an example of Janssen wise, um, and this is an irreducible lattice in a product of trees. So if you take the fundamental group of this thing, it's the smallest example that you can get where you get an action on a product of trees, which doesn't, isn't a product of two different, actually that's what it would be, irreducible would mean to take 
a product of one action on a, on a tree and another. So in particular, so it's a strange thing to think about these irreducible lattices. Okay, um, they gave, um, yeah, there were people who were interested in them in various, various contexts. Um, there, were, there were also examples uh, of Berger and Moses. Um, it, these, these were infinite simple groups. That were constructed in this way, if you like, although their examples had many more, many more squares. Um, and they didn't even think about it in terms of these quotients, but it sits in this category. So, well, all, all I want to tell you with these, these examples is that even in dimension two, like a very simple recipe, right, where you're gluing squares together, you can get interesting, interesting examples. Um, yeah, so this is an example of a, a non-residually finite group. So this was a non-residual. In fact, in fact, so so the I don't want to get into the whole history of it. There was uh, his example, his original examples many many years ago uh, had more squares in them. Um, but yeah, there were examples of groups that were not residually finite. There were cat zero groups that were not residually finite. Um, and so yeah, I mean, then they. You know, these were infinite, later Berger and Moses produced some that were even infinite simple groups. Um, yeah, so this is, this is a, there's a whole story here that I, um, I don't want to belabor. Uh, okay, so. Okay, um, uh, so Salvetti complexes, because these, so the, this, the first thing you should think about in, in this context is think of a torus. So the first thing you think about is an n-dimensional torus. How would you, how would you cubulate an n-dimensional? Dimensional torus. And what would you do? Well, you would just take it as a product of, of circles, right? You would just take, like a three-dimensional torus would be just take a cube and identify opposite sides. Okay? Um, and so, um, so uh, identify Identify um, opposite sides of of a cube, okay, and you'll get a torus. You should think about what the link will be. What's the link? So I guess the first thing to do is to think about a two-dimensional torus. What's the link of a vertex in a two-dimensional torus? Circle, but topologically it's a circle, but it's it's got this nice structure of a of a square. Okay, what would it be for a three-dimensional cubule? So try to think about what would be the link of a vertex. Okay, so there are many different ways to, to think about it. Um, the way I like to think about it is you take a the Simplex that you've got here, okay? That's a nice simplicial complex. One simplex, and blow up each point to two points, and then for each edge, draw this complete bipartite graph. So it's like the okay, the two-point blow up of a of a graph, okay? And then fill in simplices whenever they're supposed to be there, okay? So I better not draw more edges. That'll be a disaster, right? But hey, everybody see that? You just, so blow up, take a simplex. Blow up each vertex to two points. Uh, 
and each edge to K22, the complete bipartite graph on these vertices and, and fill in to make a flag complex. Okay, you should convince yourself in dimension three that you get a nice octahedron, right? It's what you normally think of, dimension three. So maybe do dimension three first and then think about how you do the end dimension case. Okay, so that's that. Uh, that's a torus. So, uh, so a right angled. So the the group. Well, what's the group that you're you're thinking about over here? The group you're thinking about is is the n. That's the fundamental group of this complex, and it's acting really, you know, properly and co-compactly on R n. So a right angled Artin group. That's people write as a rag. Okay. Um, is a group uh, given in the following way. So you take a graph, gamma, a finite graph, usually a finite graph. And then um, your your group G is uh, you take the vertices of gamma as your generating set, and then um, V and W mute if and only if V uh, W is an edge in gamma. Okay, so you build this group which uh, has these mutation relations, right? If there were if there were no edges in your graph, then you just get the free groups. If you took the complete graph, did I do something wrong? What? V W is an edge. Oh, is zero. Well, that's a relation. V commutes with W. You don't. Yeah, I don't know. You, you like to put V W equals zero. That makes you happy. Yeah, see, so you, you guys, are, they're going to get in a fight here in a little bit. Yeah, one, that's true. I mean, it's not necessarily a commutative group, so we don't get to use zero. Okay? But, you know, usually people write generators and relations. They don't have to say the relations are equal to zero. That's, Im that's implied. Um, anyway, uh, so you'd think these are like the stupidest groups you could think of, right? They're just either free or they're abelian, all their subgroups are can all be of the same form. Well, it turns out that's not true. You can embed lots of things in, in rags. That's um, another part of, of the story here that I, I may get to in due course. Um, uh, so, well, how are you going to build a, a cube complex for this? Um, well, so uh, the Salvetti complex. Salvetti complex uh, associated gamma is, well, you take a loop for each generator. So, so a loop for each generator, okay? i.e. vertex of gamma, right? Take a loop. And then what are you going to do whenever they commute? What do you think you, could, you should do? You put in a torus, right? And then whenever you have a click, you glue in an end torus. So attach an end torus for each. each click in gamma, okay? So every time you... So that's, this is some complex that's built out of tori that are glued along sub tori in some strange way, okay? Along some pattern which is, which is encoded gamma. 
Okay, and you should convince yourself that this complex, so we'll call this k gamma, that pi one of k gamma is nothing more than gamma. That's just the Van Kampen theorem, really. And that this complex uh, k gamma, this is what we call k gamma, is, is non-positively curved. And you should, again, um, one of the things you should think about is the link, and I sort of told you how you do it here. Okay, the link will, will be built out of these different simplicial complexes. Okay, and is, is a flag complex. So, so you, you just fill in. Okay, so whenever you see, whenever you see, um, like let's say A and B commute, you glue in a square. And if you saw three of them, then you attach a three cube in such a way, uh, uh, in such a way that these loops are going along these edges here. Okay, so um, when you take a cube and you identify opposite faces, what will happen, there'll be a single vertex in the quotient, a single vertex in the quotient, and these edges become loops. Okay, so you'll get n loops depending on the dimension of the cube. And that's what I mean here. These, if there were n loops here, they would be those n loops in that torus. So it's sort of the, in the standard way. Okay, so this becomes, okay, it becomes a, a torus with a family of nice subtori that are all nice right angled. Things. Everything is nice and right angled. That's why it's a nice complex. So when you glue, for example, if you try to think about, try to think about the, say this, or maybe this, try to think about the square complex that you get for this. Well, it's you get a torus for each one of these. So this one is a torus, and there's another torus here, and there's a loop here glued to that loop, and then there's a torus here, and color, no, color chunk is here, and this loop, which is the other standard loop on the sides of the square, gets glued to some loop over here. Okay, so you think of these, one way to think about it is taking these three tori and gluing them together. But that's the same as this recipe here of taking three loops, taking four loops, excuse me, four loops and gluing in uh, tori. Okay, is that helpful? Yeah, so you should play with uh, a few examples, I mean, uh, to see what these guys look like. I try to imagine their universal covers. So, for example, here the universal cover is built from flats, right? Nice two-dimensional flats glued along lines, and when the lines meet, they meet at 90 degrees. Okay, so you should, you should hallucinate, spend some time hallucinating tonight about the universal cover of this thing here. Um, okay. Um, so, the, there's a, there are nice objects that people play with inside of cube complexes, and these are hyperplanes. And these are sort of the main, understanding how these, the combinatorics of how these interact with one another is how you analyze group actions on cat zero cube complexes. They play an important role. So, so there are different ways of doing this. Um, so, so a mid cube, of a cube is um, the intersection, maybe a cube C, is the intersection of C with the plane parallel uh, the plane of dimension, 
dimension of C minus one, so one lower dimension, um, parallel to one of the faces and going through the very center of C. So that's just the middle of the cube, right? You think of the point, if it's zero, one, you think of the point a half, a half, a half, a half. That's the middle of the cube. So So for a three-dimensional cube, there are three different mid-cubes, right? So for their n different mid-cubes for, for an n-dimensional cube. Okay, so I want to sort of extend mid-cubes from one cube into the next cube. That's one way you can think of what a hyperplane is. But uh, the, probably the best way to, cleanest way to define it is you define an equivalence relation on, on edges. So if you, you want E is equivalent to F, if and only if E and F are opposite sides of of a square well that's not an equivalence relation but so you take an equivalence relation so let tilde be the equivalence relation generated by this, okay? So if you're looking at a three-dimensional cube, then all of these guys are equivalent, right? So there are three equivalence relations in three equivalence classes in the edges of a three-dimensional cube. Okay, so that's an equivalence relation on edges in a at zero cube complex. Okay, you can even define it in a, in a non-positively curved one. So, um, a hyperplane in a cat zero cube complex is a union of, is the union a union of mid cubes um, transverse to an equivalence class. So, okay, so you, you think of, let's think of a simple, I'll leave this one. You can try to think of what the hyperplanes look like there. Euclidean plane chopped up into into squares. That's a nice cat zero square complex. That's the universal cover of the torus. Right here, your hyperplanes are just lines, right? Like these are your, your hyperplanes. If you took a surface, here you'd be looking at a non-positively curved guy. Okay, so you can think of what your hyperplanes would look like here, and then you can lift them, the guys in the universal cover. Well, uh, let's see, how did I do my identifications? Well, you, know, you would go like that, and wherever this got glued to, so let me, let me fill it in anyway. Okay, so if you think about how this got glued 
So that got glued to this, right? This got glued to here. So then you would continue this way. And then this got glued to that. So that's one hyperplane. Everybody see that? That's one hyperplane inside of this non-positively curved guy. What will it look like in the universal cover? Well, the, what's the universal cover of this thing? It's just a hyperbolic plane, which you imagine now is chopped up into little tiny squares. Okay? And each one of these things you know, is topologically a line. Okay? And in fact, it will have a nice Z stabilizer. So this will be quasi-geodesic inside the hyperbolic plane in terms of its intrinsic metric. Okay? But here you, you could sort of think, well, this is just a geodesic inside of this with respect to this metric. Um, maybe you can think about, the next thing you think about is what happens in this example. So what, what will happen here? Okay, well, because of the way the coloring went over here, which I did very badly, by the way, you guys didn't say anything. So actually, these are all supposed to be different from the side ones. So here, there, if you think about it, there will be two hyperplanes. There will be vertical ones, and then there will be horizontal ones. And they will form two hyperplanes. So they'll be kind of like these two graphs inside of this complex. Now, um, generally speaking, in these examples that I've drawn here, you, you, it looks like, well, look, this hyperplane here is nice and embedded. Okay. Well, it doesn't have to be. Okay. You can build non-positively curved complexes where there's even just one hyperplane. You sort of go around and you come back and it crosses itself in some horrible way. Okay. That doesn't... Uh, In fact, in, in most examples that you will try to do, you take random squares and start going together so they satisfy the non-positive curvature condition, most of your planes uh, will not be embedded. Okay, but in a, if you think about a cat zero guy, which is now, again, the cat zero guy you think of as the universal cover, it's a nice simply connected thing, then here, want to point out here that you've got your hyperplanes kind of look like something like that. They don't necessarily have to be of the same dimension uh, that the cubes inside of the hyperplane. But they have some nice key features when you just think about, oh, it's nice to think about, by the way, of what the hyperplanes look like in this complex. Try to think of pick your favorite, pick your favorite rag, like maybe this one. Try to analyze what the hyperplanes look like, and if they're associated to some rag, maybe, okay, that's sitting inside of here. Okay, so the the key thing here is that it's one, it's just one lower dimension, and it locally locally separates. And so, in fact, um, in cat zero, in a cat zero cube complex, um, hyperplanes have nice properties. So, so the first thing is that uh, every hyperplane is embedded. So you might imagine a situation where you know this went around. Right? 
you might imagine a situation like this, and your hyperplane went like that and crossed itself. Okay? You might imagine something like that could happen. Um, well, in a cat zero cube complex, that doesn't happen. And uh, that's sort of a feature of this, this non-positive curvature condition. In the quotient guys, the non-positively curved guys, this can happen, okay? But in, in the simply connected situation, it doesn't. Okay? So it acts just like it does in the plane or in a tree, cross a tree, where the hyperplanes are trees, okay? And so on. So it's embedded. Um, uh, it separates. to two components. Okay, so that's something that, again, isn't, certainly isn't true for the torus, right? If you think of the torus, you take these hyperplanes that are sitting inside there, well, they won't separate. But in the universal cover, again, in the universal cover, they do. So. Um, and the, each hyperplane uh, is itself a cat zero cube complex. So that's something it inherits its non-positive curvature from the non-positive curvature of the ambient uh, cube complex. So. That's a very nice thing when you're trying to make, say, induction arguments on some something. Maybe you'll get lucky, and, and something will be a function of dimension, and then you'll prove it for dimension n, and then go up. Okay, so that's that's a useful. It's, yeah, it's in fact it's isometrically embedded in the cat zero metric uh, that you get from the cubes. Okay, so you have to be very careful. It's not like if you took a surface with its hyperbolic metric, that would be one thing. And there's a metric that actually comes from the squares being Euclidean squares, and you tighten things, and there's a metric that comes from that, the path metric that comes from that. These things will be convex in that. Okay, and in fact, they're geodesically extendable, right? Every, if you extend a geodesic, no matter how you extend it, you always stay inside the hyperplane, once you're in a hyperplane. So the, yeah. So the, the point is, suppose you had three squares glued along here. Well, if I went just like that, that would be just convex. But if I, I can also to go into that cube. So this yellow object I drew here was not geodesically complete, or whatever the word, geodesic, what's the word for this? When you extend a geodesic, it's geodesically complete, extendable geodesics inside of this thing. So that any geodesic that you extend in, in X, it sits started off in the hyperplane, stays in the hyperplane. Because I took that, that guy too. So everywhere I bifurcate, I take all the du possible directions I can go in. Okay, and that also explains, doesn't give proof of anything, but it explains also why it separates. You might think you could go from this side to that side by somehow sneaking around it somewhere, but it won't let you because you extend it in all possible directions. That's the intuitive proof of why they separate. Uh, and the final thing, you know, final property that I wanted to isolate. Everybody's hungry? You guys all hungry? I was starving over there, just being very polite. Three minutes, right? Is that what I have? <laughs> so I'll just state the final property. So uh, this is heli property. So um, if H1 to Hn are 
hyperplanes, which pairwise intersect, then in fact they all intersect. So the intersection of H I is not empty. So oh, you might imagine you had sort of three hyperplanes that look like this. Well, you don't. If you had three hyperplanes that pairwise intersected, they would actually, you can sort of imagine this in R3, right? Um, this thing is telling me I'm done. So these are the these four properties of the main properties that we're gonna, gonna play with. Okay, I, won't, I won't go into the proofs of why these things are true, um, but um, they're, they're the key elements that you can play with to, to prove various things. Okay, so I'll, I'll continue with that uh, next time.